because I know how much you all know about this issue already and all the work you've done. And so I want to just talk uh, not too much before we open it up to some question and, and conversation about what we can all do to address what is, um, as you know, a very serious question about uh, what I see is nothing less than whether government of, for, and by the people is going to make it. Uh, and it's a, in some ways, age-old question in America, um, and it's one that every generation has to answer. And, and we've got, uh, the good thing about Citizens United is we've got our opportunity to uh, answer that question with a, a, a defiant, yes, government of the people will survive, uh, government of the corporation has to end. And um, that's what my book is about. So I hope you'll read the book. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Um, so the title's obvious, Corporations Are Not People. But uh, you know, why did we need a book to say that? Uh, and why did I write this book? It's, it's a paperback intentionally. It's got resources in the back. The idea is it's, a, it's almost like a pamphlet you know, that you can take and you give to your friends and you pull out the pages and you, and you use it uh, kind of as a, a manual to um, do what I, what I hope it will help uh, as, as many of the work, much of the work that you're doing will help to, uh, to really res return to the notion that we are a republic, a, a democracy of free and equal people, uh, that we're not, we're not servants of a global corporate order. Um, that's really what's at stake in, in my view. And so the book uh, is about Citizens United, but it actually goes back and tries to answer the question to a lot of people uh, you know, who haven't been working on corporate personhood for years and haven't followed these kind of issues. And, and Citizens United came like a thunderbolt in, in many ways to the American people. It was like, you know, the, the court said corporations are essentially the same as people for speech rights and that even though we've done it for a century, we're not allowed to regulate their money in elections anymore. Uh, the, the, and, and I tell you to almost every American, they viscerally, we viscerally react to that. That's not right. And people know it's not right. And it doesn't matter if you're on the left or the right or the center, uh, that people know that's not what America's about. And that's the big opportunity. Um, so it came as a thunderbolt, but uh, the book shows why it happened, how it happened, and then I hope how we can fix it. And so to go back to where, where did this thunderbolt come from? Where, how could it possibly be that Citizens United uh, could just disregard a century of law? And I, I go back to Earth Day, really, in the book. Um, in April 1970, uh, and you know, people sometimes remember uh, the turmoil of the 60s and the challenges of the Vietnam War and so forth, but we forget sometimes how vibrant the democracy we had actually was. We had 20 million people in the streets on that first Earth Day, and they were of all parties once again. They were Americans who were tired of rivers catching on fire, air being unbreathable, water being polluted and dirty, and basically corporations externalizing the poisons and the toxics and keeping the profit. And, and we demanded a, a better arrangement, a, one, a more just arrangement. And it was amazing how responsive American democracy was, that within a few short years, uh, some, in some cases just months after that April 1970 Earth Day, we had an astonishing wave of reform. The Environmental Protection Agency was created the first time ever. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Hazardous Substances Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act. I mean, can you imagine Congress doing that today? And that was with a Republican in the White House, Richard Nixon, and a, a, a split Congress of Democrats and Republicans voting for this. And it's because of the American people, we demanded it and we got it. And by the way, we also amended the Constitution in those years to eliminate the poll tax, which kept the poor and especially African Americans from having equal access to voting, and we lowered the voting age to 18. 18, 19, and 20 year olds could vote. Uh, and then of course the consumer protection laws, Ralph Nader doing so much to help change the idea that you know corporations did not have to uh, you know, address the safety of their products, the dangers of their products to people, uh, civil rights laws, and so on. So in, we should have celebrated uh, how effective our democracy was, and maybe we did celebrate too much and too early because there was a reaction to this, and, and that's, 
uh, as many of you know, um, most articulated by Lewis Powell's memo to the Chamber of Commerce. And I describe this in my book. Um, Lewis Powell, you may know, was a uh, Richmond, Virginia corporate lawyer at the time. Uh, he was on the board of a dozen corporations. He was on the executive committee and board of directors of the Philip Morris Cigarette Corporation. And he was an advisor to the Chamber of Commerce. And he wrote out a memo. Uh, you know, his description of this wave of effective democracy was an attack on the free enterprise system. That's what he called the memo. And he laid out a game plan for how to essentially disconnect the levers of democracy from the American people with what he called an organized, well-funded corporate campaign. He said, corporations need to work together, fund a multi-year, multi-decade if necessary, campaign to use his words, activist-minded courts to protect corporations. Uh, he, had a, he talked about media, he talked about things like ALEC, which I was glad to hear Chapman talk about, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, talked about setting up a whole infrastructure to create corporate power and corporate rights. And the amazing thing is, six months after outlining this memo to the Chamber of Commerce, which took his advice, set up the Chamber, National Chamber Litigation Center, and, and much more, which I'll talk about, President Nixon appointed Lewis Powell to the Supreme Court. So he went on the court. He was actually appointed the same day as, as uh, William Rehnquist, who was a well-known conservative, and um, some criticized him for that. But nobody knew about this memo. He, he, you know, he went through the nomination process, never disclosed the memo to the chamber, and never disclosed the plan to use an activist-minded Supreme Court to, to create corporate rights. The chamber never disclosed it. It was never, never, nobody asked a question about it. He was viewed as a moderate somebody who wasn't very activist. Um, Rehnquist was actually considered the, you know, the, the dangerous one because he was conservative. Powell was considered a, a gentle moderate uh, because the American people weren't told about this sort of radical corporate rights plan that he had outlined. And Lewis Powell went on in the next six to eight years to write the opinions, very close decisions that created what is called the corporate speech doctrine, basically corporate speech rights. Um, David mentioned the Bellotti case, which was a First National Bank of Boston and the Gillette Corporation and the Digital Equipment Corporation sued, Frank Bellotti was an attorney general in Massachusetts, um, sued him to block the attorney general from enforcing a law that was that said corporations should not spend money in citizen referenda. That was the law because citizen referenda have not, has nothing to do with corporations and the actual referendum at issue is whether Massachusetts should have a progressive income tax. Bank Boston, Gillette, Digital Equipment Corporation, which as a corporation should have no interest in whether we have a progressive income tax or not. What's that, what does that matter to the corporation? Wanted to fund a, a way to defeat that plan the law said you can't. The people of Massachusetts don't want corporate money in our elections, in our referenda. The first time in American history the Supreme Court ever said that we don't have the power to define our fair and free and clean elections uh, and that we have to allow corporations to spend money in the citizen referenda. It was kind of a foreshadowing of the Citizens United case 30-something years later. Um, Lewis Powell wrote that decision five to four. He went on to write decisions that struck down environmental laws, uh, uh, protecting utility corporations from laws that said utility corporations should stop promoting energy consumption for the benefit of shareholders when the public interest was conservation. Um, utility corporations in California were given the free speech right to distribute corporate propaganda in the bill inserts, which actually belong to the people under the public utilities law. Uh, they struck down laws regulating tobacco uh, advertising in the Attorney General's office. I worked on the tobacco litigation and we knew it's now been, this isn't an allegation, this is proven. Um, a federal judge has concluded after a long trial, it's not a settlement, long trial fought hard by the tobacco companies that they engaged in a civil racketeering conspiracy. It's a, the RICO statute, it's usually used against the mafia. Uh, but there was, it was, they were found to be liable for civil RICO in the federal 
courts upheld on appeal by a appellate court of Republicans and Democrats. This isn't, so this isn't an allegation. They targeted children. They advertised around middle schools and playgrounds. They have internal memoranda saying we need to get teenagers addicted because if they don't start smoking before 18, they are unlikely to be lifetime customers. The memo is called the children replacement smokers for the ones who were going to die. Uh, it, and so we absolutely knew their business model was to figure out how to get 13, 14, and 15-year-olds addicted to a deadly drug. And so we had a law in Massachusetts that said a thousand foot buffer zones around playgrounds and schoolyards. The, Phil, the, the Philip Morris, Lewis Powell's old company, and the other tobacco corporations sued and said that violates our free speech rights. And they won. They went up to the, we won all the way up, but it got to the Supreme Court. They won and they were held to have a corporate speech right to do that, even though they had behaved in that manner. Uh, Monsanto has a corporate speech right. Yeah. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> they are evil. <laughs> Except they're not evil because they're not people, as my book will talk about. You know, and that's part of the problem is that they're not good, they're not evil, they don't love, they don't hate. Um, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Monsanto does very bad things in, in the world, I, I believe. And one of the bad things they do, you know, Monsanto... Um, some of you may know, they make agent, they, they, their, their products before they started thinking that they should make food was to make things like Agent Orange and DDT. And, but now they do genetically modified drugs in industrial food production. And one of their drugs is to force cows, dairy cows, to produce more milk than dairy cows are designed to do, <laughs> if you can call it cows being designed. But um, they, they uh, Monsanto's RBST drug, is injected into cow's blood and forces them to produce more milk than they should. They get sick, so then they're pumped with antibiotics. Um, this is a drug that every democracy in the world, except the United States, has banned. It's illegal to use in Europe, in Australia, in Canada, in Japan. It, the FDA waved it through. So the people of Vermont, and I tell this story in my book, a fellow named Dexter Randall, 65-year-old dairy farmer, and then, if you know Vermont, it's nor the Northeast Kingdom is a, it's a Vermonter back there. Go ahead. Um, and he organized his neighbors. He did what we're doing tonight, you know, gathered together, talking about this problem. They tried to convince the FDA not to approve it, like other democracies did. They didn't listen. They approved it. So they started working on their state legislature, saying at least we should have disclosure. At least force them to put on the label of milk or ice cream or or other dairy products, whether the milk came from cows that have been treated with this drug, uh, because it has human health effects, it has effects on what kind of farming we want to support, it has effects on the economy, of, especially in places like Vermont, where the organic dairies are very important for the economy, and you have this industrialized system that consumers, are, you know, people might not actually want to support if they had a choice. So put it on the label, and people can decide for themselves. That law, they won, finally, over the lobbyists, over everything. They got that law. They were sued. The state was sued. That law was struck down. And this time, Monsanto and the industrial dairies had the corporate right not to speak. That was their argument. They said, we don't want to put that on the label, and you can't make us because we have a free speech right not to say anything. And they won. So that is the problem we're dealing with. It's Citizens United... I, I call it sort of, it's the end game. If you're a football fan, it's the end zone dance and the spike in the, in the, in the end zone. It's the culmination of what this, this Powell Chamber of Commerce game plan to create something that is absolutely alien to the American system of government, of corporate rights that disconnect and trump our right to make our laws. And that's what happened. And so what Citizens United did to the five justices who agreed in Citizens United that were not allowed. So what, as you know, Citizens United said, essentially, it struck down the McCain-Feingold law that had restricted corporate spending in elections, as David said. It goes back to the Tillman Act, which has restricted corporate money in federal elections since the Ro Theodore Roosevelt administration. And to the five justices who said, oh, no, that all is out the window. Corporations have a right that the trumps are decision as a majority of the people to regulate the corporate money. To them, it was perfectly logical. If, if you have a right 
to market to children around, you know, to put Joe Camel in advertisements around schoolyards, if you've got a right to not care whether the law of the state is conservation, if you have a right to hide how, what you do to your industrial agriculture system from the people, then politics and elections are even more important. So you should have a right there too. So the logic of it was impeccable in some ways, but only if you had gone so far off the deep end of what government of the people is supposed to be about. Um, so, and, that, and you see it in the decision, you read the decision, and it is, it is in some ways off the deep end in the sense of you, the whole issue is, what is um, whether Congress can make a, a rule for corporations different than for human beings in elections. You will not find in that decision a definition of what a corporation is. No, no discussion of why Congress might have made a different rule for a corporation than for a human being. Um, instead, you'll hear about voices. No voices can be silenced. You'll hear about um, all speakers must be free. Uh, and then you'll hear the, perhaps the, the most uh, strangest ironic description of what the corporations at issue were, that Congress is not allowed to make a law that um, affects unfairly a disadvantaged class of persons. That's, that's what they call the, the corporations affected by this. So we need to change that. And, and the problem is partly abuse of language, but it's also abuse of our rights, abuse of the law, and, and we will change it. There was an outstanding dissent by Justice Stevens, hardly a radical. I should say, I, I mentioned uh, Justice Rehnquist. He dissented in all those cases that Lewis Powell wrote. So this is not left and right or conserv conservative justice. William Rehnquist filed great dissents talking about how corporations are not people. He said that the reason Massachusetts might have had a law that's different for corporations and our spending in elections back in that Bellotti case is that uh, unlike, uh, well, how did he put it? He said that um, uh, corp uh, people owe their existence to something higher than the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> so his point was, you know, corporations are creations of the state. The state can make the rules for them. The people can make the rules for them. We, the people, get our rights from something higher than the state. And so that was his point, and he, did, he said it over and over again. Uh, and so the reason Citizens United happened is Chief Justice Rehnquist died and Sandra Day O'Connor retired. The exact same law that was struck down in Citizens United was upheld as constitutional by this Supreme Court in only 2003 in a case called McConnell. So nothing had changed in those six years except Samuel Alito came on and Chief Justice Roberts came on the court. That's all that changed and that's not how law is supposed to be. So we need to, to change this and we will change it. I was saying Justice Stevens hardly a radical, has a great dissent. It's really a roadmap for what the law should be, why corporations are different, why we the people have the right to make the rules that apply to corporations. He was appointed by Gerald Ford and was a Republican corporate lawyer. I mean, Justice Stevens is not, um, you know, he probably wouldn't join free speech for people and move to amend an alliance for, for democracy, but maybe he would now, because uh, I think we're actually seeing a lot of people who thought they won't join in, in groups that are sort of working on this big change because they didn't think it was necessary. But we're seeing now people get it. It doesn't matter what their politics are, whether they're f for business or not. They, they get it, that we need to change this. And so the last part of the book, and then I'll be quiet so we can all share in the conversation, um, is about how we can change it. So the, the, the why corporations have more rights than you do, it's the story of a concentrated game plan, well executed, well funded for 30 years to make this result happen. Um, the way we get it back is to be, work just as hard, just as relentlessly, take as long as it takes to get our country back and get our rights back to make the rules that we will be a government of the people, not of the corporations. And so step number one is a constitutional amendment campaign. Um, we've had a one-way constitutional power struggle. The corporations have been pulling the power out of the Constitution and we haven't been pulling back because it was hard to see that it was happening. And that's the great thing about Citizens United. It's so bad, it was so clear, it said so starkly what most Americans don't believe that 
it has woken people up to say, oh, we are in a fight for our country. We're in a fight for our democracy. And the way we've always won those fights is through the constitutional amendment process. So Citizens United gave us a proposition that corporations have the same rights as we do under the Constitution. We can accept it or we can say no way. And the way you say no way is Article 5 of the Constitution, which is the amendment article. And it's been used 27 times. Seven of those times overturned Supreme Court cases. If you think it doesn't happen anymore, well, the most recent was in 1992. We had amendments in every decade of the 20th century except the 80s and the 40s. So, and, and, and the progressive era, which I think of as much like ours, where a gilded age had just gone too far, corporate power had gone too far, uh, the progressives came together, Democrats, Republicans, to say, no, our, our country's gone off track, democracy isn't working, and they rebuilt our democracy with no fewer than four amendments in 10 years. Um, one of them was prohibition, so we don't need to try that one again. But the other three were really good. Uh, women got the right to vote. Senators got elected directly rather than appointed in back rooms. And the Supreme Court, which had ruled that we, the people, do not have the power to have a federal income tax, overturned that case and said, yes, we do. And that's why we have a federal income tax. So if you think this amendment is hard, imagine being the people who had to campaign for an income tax amendment. So, so we can do this, and we need to do it like our grandparents and parents and great-grandparents did, which is to define the amendment. We don't have to worry right now about which one's perfect or which one says this. Is the, uh, We know what it needs to do. It needs to take back rights for people, not corporations, and it needs to give us the power again to make the rules for fair, free, equal elections and get all that corrupted money out of the election process and get some public money in so people can run without having to you know, go to the wealthy and the corporations and, and then answer to them so that we will actually have an equal process. So that's what the amendments need to do. And there's some great ones out there. And, you know, if we can combine them into one amendment, great. If we get two amendments, there's no reason, you know, just like the progressives didn't say, oh, well, we got the senators elected directly. I guess women will have to wait another 50 years for the right to vote. No, they knew what they had to do to make the democracy work, and we do too. And so we just have to keep pushing till we get both of those pieces. And then number three, and I talk about the, how we can do this in the book, but number three is that we need to remember and take back our duty, really, to make the rules for corporations. That these are state laws that decide what corporations can do and what they can't do. And, uh, you know, corporate law sounds, you put those two words together and there's hardly anything that can, you can imagine being more boring, corporate law, right? But that is what makes limited liability. That's what makes perpetual life. That's what makes the rules of the game. And right now, a small club in Delaware is making the rules of the game for the, for the world, really, and especially for our country. Most of the corporations are chartered out of Delaware uh, for, for historical and other reasons. Um, and th th that charter law, that corporate law, comes from the Delaware legislature. And, and so that's another thing where we just don't have to accept that. And if we do accept that, we will not get the ability to make a world that any of us would want to live in, that this, un this relentless global corporate machine will just be, um, you know, just destroy everything that is of value to people. Even, and, and that's not to say the people who work in the corporations are evil or anything. It's that the structures, we've forgotten that they're tools that we need to get back under control. I, I call them in the book, um, you know, they're tools, they're, they're more like gasoline or guns. They're not people. They're tools, and they have good uses, but they also need to be... Um, you know, you need to make sure people using them know how to use them, and you need to make sure that they're used safely. Uh, and that, that falls to us to do that. So those are the three pieces. Amendment, People's Rights Amendment, overturn the corporate personhood doctrine, and this, this Lewis Powell Chamber of Commerce corporate speech doctrine. Get the money out of politics amendment, probably there too, and maybe part of the same one, as I said, public funding in. And three, corporate 
law reform. Charters can be revoked. Even now we have laws that say charters can be revoked. Free Speech for People has brought a charter revocation action against Massey Energy, which has uh, killed 29 uh, mine workers. Yes, that's, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's really important for a number of reasons. This is to the Delaware, it's sitting in the Delaware's Attorney General's office now. Delaware has a law, like other states, that corporate, a corporate charter is a privilege. It's not a right. And if it's abused, it can be revoked. And the Attorney General has the authority to bring an action to have it revoked. The standard is whether corporations have violated the law. We submitted a letter that outlined Massey Energy after the Upper Big Branch mine explosion killed 29 people, 65,000 violations of law. And the report that described how that explosion happened linked it directly to Massey's corrupt spending of money in West Virginia politics so that the West Virginia government, which was supposed to be protecting the people, couldn't protect the people. That, the, that if they tried to enforce the law, they'd get a call essentially. The laws were, the 13, on top of that 65,000 violations, 13,000 violations of the Clean Water Act because they've ripped 500 mountains up. They're, they're gone. They've been blown up. 500 Appalachian Mountains don't exist anymore because Massey has blown them up, taken the coal out, and where the mountains ended up is in 2,500 miles of streams. If you dumped fill into 25 feet of a stream in your backyard, you'd risk going to jail. They've dumped mountains into 2,500 miles of streams with no accountability whatsoever. So that is a classic case of a corporate charter that needs to be revoked, and, and the law is on the books, and we're, we're going to try to enforce it, and that helps remind all of us that these corporate privileges are just that, privileges, and when they're abused, we need to take back the privilege. So those are some of the ideas in the book. The way we can win this, oh, I have news, by the way, and... Um, this is a movement. It's happening across the country. You, the Portland City Council um, did, did that resolution. It was fantastic. Portland, Maine, on the other coast, did this. New York City, Los Angeles, lots of towns and cities. Ten Massachusetts town meetings have done it um, in, in my home state, where you have government by New England town meeting overwhelmingly passed. People want this amendment. So we've been also working on state legislatures. Um, in the end, we'll need two-thirds of Congress to do it ratified by three quarters of the states, or a convention, but the way we've done all 27 is th two-thirds of Congress sends a bill to the states to be ratified by three quarters of the states. So we've got action happening in Congress, and there's, as I said, good amendments there, but what we need are state resolution, local resolutions, the, the, the places of worship, as I said, doing resolutions, wherever people gather. But the news is today, just this afternoon, we won our first state resolution, the New, uh, New Mexico Senate, we got the House last week, uh, but the New Mexico Senate passed a, a resolution to overturn Citizens United, demanding that Congress send an amendment to the states uh, for ratification. It passed 20 to 9 in the Senate. So. Uh, so it really is happening. You, you probably heard about the Montana Supreme Court. Uh, we filed an amicus brief there. The Montana Supreme Court said, well, Citizens United isn't going to strike down our law in Montana. Uh, the Corrupt Practices Act in Montana bans corporate spending in elections. The Attorney General there, Steve Bullock, said this was passed by the People's Referendum in 1912. I'm not about to let it die without a fight, um, even though Citizens United probably made pretty clear the Supreme Court wish to kill laws like that. Uh, but he fought it, and he won in the Supreme Court of Montana. It's on its way to the Supreme Court in the U.S., where it, it will have a less friendly reception, I think. But, but he won, and he won five to two. And here's the fascinating thing. The two dissenters who said, they, they said, you know, we hate Citizens United, but it's the law of the land. The Supreme Court said it, so we have to follow it. But then went on for about 70 pages saying, essentially everything that was wrong with Citizens United and really took the Supreme Court to school, in my view, on, on that. It's a fascinating opinion, and it ends with um, Justice Nelson, uh, Nelson of the Supreme Court of Montana, writes, um, the sad irony is that unlike people, corporations uh, cannot uh, get the death penalty and can't go to hell. <laughs> so... so 
again, this is a Supreme Court justice in, a, in the state of Montana. So once again, we're seeing this is not just you know, rabble-rousing anymore. This is everybody, essentially. The 99.9% .9 supports this effort, and we have to do everything we can. We have a, a moment of a unique, historic opportunity to really reset the American Republic for the 21st century in a way that will actually work for everybody. Um, so I hope you'll continue to do the great work you're doing. I hope we'll work together, and I know we're going to win this. Thank you very much.